This is Dr. Joshua Fredenberg coming to you back at the Future Leaders Conference. Hope that you all had an incredible uh, brunch for some and lunch for others. I'm so excited uh, to get back into this conference and get back into this conversation in regards to empowering you for uh, not only collegiate success, but positioning you for career success as well. Um, I'm so honored today and so grateful and appreciative that we have some incredible student leaders uh, that are going to be joining us today. Each of them um, are at different levels in their collegiate journey. Um, they've all actually been a part of the Circle of Change Leadership Conference. So getting them to come and give back to all of you was not hard at all. And so I'm so grateful for them. And really what we're going to do for this next hour is I have a series of questions that many of you uh, pose in the registration form that we'll be going through. But throughout the discussion, if you ever have any additional questions that you would like to ask, just put it in the chat box and um, we're going to answer as many as we can. The goal is to do this for about an hour, but if we have to go about 10 minutes over, that is perfectly fine because we want to make sure that we are asked, we are answering as many of your questions as possible. And these are from students and these are from leaders and these are from people that have not only maximized their collegiate experience, but they have went on to graduate school. Uh, one of our parents actually graduated and created a book called College Material. So we got an array of people here today that are going to be sharing their insight and their wisdom with you. So I'm so excited uh, just to have this panel here. I'm so excited to introduce all of them. They're all wonderful people. And so I'm going to get ready to get started by introducing them all right now. And so my first panelist that I would like to introduce today is Karina. Uh, Karina, if you could uh, introduce yourself, uh, tell us what year you are in school right now, and what are three things you would tell yourself when you were just beginning college? It's on you. Yeah, so my name is Karina. I am a fifth year. This is going to be my final semester at Cal Poly Pomona. I am a liberal studies major, and I also have a minor in multicultural leadership. Uh, so the three lessons that I um, have learned or would tell myself is to go in with the intention of learning instead of focusing on getting good grades. They do go hand in hand, of course, but it's all about how much you get out of your classes. One or two is to also get more out of your college experience is to start getting involved in your college. And this does create a community care. And then finally, you do not have to completely fill your schedule with things to do. It's okay to have little gaps in your schedule for a break. Awesome. Thank you so much, Karina. We're so excited to have you. It's going to be a great discussion. Uh, our next panelist is another student. Um, Eloy Garcia, introduce yourself. Tell us what school you go to and what are three words of wisdom that you would share with incoming freshmen. Eloy, are you there? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Eloy Garcia. I am a senior at California State University, San Bernardino, where I'm majoring in human and organizational communication with a minor in gender and sexuality studies. And my three tips are to meet with your counselor often to make sure that you are still passionate about what you're studying. And so you check in and make sure you're on the same page. Two is to also, um, focus. Remember that every day puts you that much closer to your end goal. And that's what we need to focus on. And to be patient, you know, navigating higher education is going to be difficult for, for some maybe more than others. And some days will be more difficult than others. So on those difficult days, extend yourself some extra grace. Awesome. Eloy, thank you so much, man. It's so great to have you here with us as well. Um, our next panelist is from the East Coast. We're moving to the East Coast now. These are students from all across the country. Uh, Judy, uh, welcome. Introduce yourselves. Tell us what year you are in school, where you go to school, and what are three words of wisdom that you would share with incoming freshmen or sophomore students? Hi, everyone. So I'm Judy, and um, I go to Regis College in Boston, Massachusetts. So yes, I'm up in the East Coast. Um, and I am a second year master's student in master, I'm in my master's program for counseling psychology and I should be finishing up next year, hopefully. Um, and three things that I would tell myself and tell you all 
is one and a big one for me that I've um, experienced was do not sell yourself short. Um, I think I was so quick to dismiss myself from opportunities, dismiss myself from trying new things because I didn't think I had a good resume or I didn't have anything on my resume. However, just talking and getting to know people got me so far. So don't sell yourself short. The second one is don't let the price tag or the price of something stop you from seeking an opportunity or stop you stop you from you know trying something um once again i limited myself because pricing was a big deal for me certain conferences were out of my budget however i did not know that there were ways that you can pay for it there are ways that people can help you pay for it as long as you and my third one is try your hardest to make connections not only within the school but outside of the school because you'll be surprised on how how helpful people can be outside of the school. And for me, I realized that even outside of the school, some people are even more helpful than, you know, my counselor or, you know, my professor. So those are the things, things I would share. Awesome. Thank you so much, Judy. It's so good to have you. Uh, our next panelist, we're staying on the East Coast. He is actually a doctoral student at an HBCU. Uh, Gerald Johnson, welcome. Introduce yourself. Tell them where you go to school. Tell them uh, your experiences and what are three words of wisdom you have to share uh, with the students today. Yes, sir, Josh. Thank you for having me on. Good afternoon and good morning for someone that, on the West Coast. I am from the East Coast. My name is Gerald Johnson. Uh, I hail from Jacksonville, Florida. I am a third year student here at Howard University in the DC area. I am majoring in higher education, leadership and policy studies. Um, Josh, if I really had to break it down to three things, I know a, a lot of our panelists have really said a lot of great answers so far. I will break it down to patience, endurance, and then connection, right? So patience, meaning that every single day uh, you can get a little bit better, right? Rome, Rome wasn't built in a day and, and neither will anything else, right? So having patience throughout your process, um, being able to endure, uh, as, as uh, I, I believe my brother Eloy said earlier, um, the higher education landscape is ever changing. It can be tough as well. So being able to, to build up your endurance throughout your journey, uh, I myself, I'm, I'm in a grad school, uh, in a grad program. So that endurance has been built up throughout. So definitely leaning on that. And lastly, this connection, right? Going back to what Judy mentioned moments ago, it's really important for you to not only connect inside of the classroom, but also outside of the classroom. How are you connecting with your faculty, your staff? and also your community members. This is all breaks down that 80-20, as we like to call it in higher education, where 80% outside the classroom and then 20% inside the classroom. So uh, really glad to be on the panel, Josh. Thank you for having me. Nah, thank you so much, Gerald. Thank you so much again. Awesome. Uh, we're gonna go back to the West Coast down in Arizona. Actually, she's getting ready to go to UNLV. Um, Skyler, introduce yourself. Tell them where you graduated from and where you're starting your graduate program this year at in three words of wisdom that you would tell yourself when you first began college. Perfect. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Skylar. Um, I am starting my first year in my master's program at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So I just recently moved here um, and I will be getting my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and then I did my undergrad at Northern Arizona University with a double major in psychological sciences and criminology and criminal justice. Um, so three words of advice. I would definitely say keep an open mind. You know, challenges are going to happen. Things are going to happen. Just be open minded no matter what comes your way. Also, don't get discouraged. Courage. Um, so for me, it's okay if you have a step back. That's totally okay. You're just going to reroute your path and get to the end goal. Um, just really having a clear mind that I want to reach my end goal 100% of the time and you will get there. And then lastly, I will just say make the most of your college experience. Get involved. Um, do what you want. Don't, don't sell yourself short um, and just be confident in yourself. Awesome. Thank you so much, Skylar. Thank you so much for being a part of this panel today. We're so excited to hear from you as well. And our, our last panelist, he's a good friend of mine based out of here in South Florida. He actually already graduated. Um, he has a book called College Material. He's a speaker as well. Zachary, introduce yourself. Let them know who you are. Let them know about your book and uh, three words of wisdom that you would give uh, to incoming freshmen and sophomores. It's in your hands. All right, good afternoon. I'm so glad to be with everyone. And uh, my name is Zachary Rinkins. I'm the author of I Am College Material. I'm a graduate of Florida a and University, and I'm pursuing a master's degree at Florida International University here in South Florida. 
And one of the things I would say to um, my 18 year old self or all college students is that it's very important to take ownership of your educational experience. It is your educational experience, so it's incumbent upon you to make the most out of it. Um, I would say the second thing is all of your connections, all of your opportunities are going to be connected to people. So you want to build as many relationships and as many connections as you possibly can. So that's something that's very important. And I would just say, keep a mind on your purpose and service. That's very important that your purpose and service, the more people you serve, the more um, lucrative the opportunity is for yourself and the more impact you'll have in this world. So those are the three things that I would talk about um, as far as advice toward young people. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zachary. Uh, it's so great to have each of you introduce yourselves. Now we get to the fun part because now we're going to start asking questions. And so I'm going to uh, I'm going to target the question at one of our panelists and then whoever else wants to chime in on the question, please feel free to uh, to speak up as well. And in addition to that, if you have questions at any moment, um, please feel free to put them in the chat box and I'm going to bring those up as much as I can. And we just want to get through as many questions as possible because we want to empower you for success. So I'm going to begin back with Karina. Karina, I want to ask you this first question that we got. What do you believe students need to do their freshman year to succeed? Not sophomore, not junior, not senior, freshman year, right when they hit the campus. What are a few things they need to do to position themselves for success? Mm -hmm. I mean, definitely go at your own pace. Um, I know that there are some campuses that will encourage you to do like 12, 15 units, depending if you're on semester or quarters. Um, you really have to go ahead and re-evaluate yourself. Be honest with yourself. What is it that you want to really do at a college campus? And so regardless of what you want to do, you still want to make sure your academics are a priority. Um, and so start out small if you really need to. I wouldn't encourage, because I'm also a, um, I am a student success ambassador for the College of Education. So I work with students all the time about their academics. And one of the biggest things that I always tell them is to make sure that, you know, you don't bite off more than when you can handle. And so um, make sure you go at your own pace. There are gonna be people around you that may want to influence you as you know, maybe that this Greek club is very attractive or this one club is very attractive for you to go into. So if you feel like you're ready, go ahead and do so, but it's not always necessary per se. And the biggest thing that I would tell, especially freshmen, is to have a big change in mindset in your classes. So for myself, and I'm only speaking on my experience, every time I went into a class, um, whether it was for my major or it was a general education course, I wanted to make sure that I understood what I got out of it. I wanted to make sure that I understood the content, that regardless of what grade I got at the end of the day that I remembered what I learned and that I feel that I can confidently say, I learned something in this class and here's what I learned. So you that kind of mentality, all of a sudden, then your grades will pretty much rock it up. There may be some instances where you have to study, of course, and you have to perhaps work a little extra hard in classes that, you know, maybe aren't um, something that you are the most skilled in. So for example, I'm not the best in science, and so I definitely had to work harder. But it's all about being honest with yourself and really having that, you know, change of mentality for myself. Awesome. Anybody else have anything to share about that question? Nobody else. Dr. Feldenberg, this is Zachary Rinkins. Um, and I definitely want to say that it's very important for young people to uh, not be afraid to ask for help. I think that that's something that's very important that they not be afraid to ask for help. When you're coming to college, you're just turning 18. A lot of things are happening with your body. A lot of things are happening with your mind. A lot of things are happening with your emotions, your hormones and things of that nature. And um, just a soft study by the American Association of um, University uh, Counselors and Psychologists, basically said that about 40% of the students that are walking on a college campus are dealing with some type of um, mental health uh, challenge or depression or something like that, don't be afraid to go to the counselors. All colleges have counselors and 
psychologists that are available, unless you admit that you're willing or, that you want to hurt yourself with someone else, is by law private. So I think it's very important to um, really work with, build a team of support, a support team for yourself to help you navigate the college experience. Whether you realize it or not, when you're 18 and you leave everything you know to go to a new campus, um, you're in a very vulnerable position. A lot of things are happening. So it's, it's okay to ask for help and really build that psychological team and counseling team and support team to really help you through the college experience and use your parents as a resource. You and your parents are partners on your journey of uh, life, happiness, and the pursuit of your education. So make sure you get the help you need. Don't be afraid to ask for help as you go through the collegiate experience. I think that's so, I think it was so incredible what you said, Zach. I, I totally agree with you and what, what Karina was saying. Don't do too much. Um, I also like that as far as your mental well-being, especially with COVID-19 and the racial injustice and all the challenges that are going on. Um, definitely want to make sure that you're armed and prepared to deal with that, that amount of challenge that's going to be happening in your collegiate experience. And uh, we got a question that came up. And so, um, oh man, I'm going to start with you, Eloy. Uh, and, and, and we're going to go through. So we've been talking about being a virtual college student. And one of the big things that came up was procrastination. Eloy or anybody else, how do you overcome college procrastination? Yeah, well, procrastination is detrimental to to the person doing it. It's not it's not good for us. Right. It puts us a step behind and it makes us stressed in the future. So as college students, when we start a new semester, when we start a new class, we should really look at it as a whole of over the over the 15 weeks, not try to take it, in my opinion, a week at a time, because it seems like, oh, I don't have that much to do. I have a little bit of time tomorrow. I'll push it off to tomorrow. When you don't, mm -hmm. if you're on the semester, you have 15 weeks worth of work. So take, be intentional with how you set up your work and remember that in the long run, you're going to have a lot less to work. At, you're going to have a lot less to work in the end of work to do in the end if you work hard in the beginning. So don't fool yourself. That extra time that you're giving yourself in the beginning is not worth it. It's really not worth it. So instead, I think briefly, find the empowerment of getting things done quickly. Get those things done off of your list. And then that free time actually feels like free time. And you know you're not cheating yourself. I love how you said it actually feels like free time. Um, anybody, any other students want to share? Uh, you can unmute yourself. Gerald, I think you just unmuted. What do you got to say, Gerald? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I echo uh, Eloy's sentiments there. And I'll kind of add an extra element to it so the students maybe can understand. I think it's, just, it's, just, it's as simple as really, um, I know we're all used to the high school seven days, I mean, seven hours a day, kind of having that schedule of how things roll and how things run. Where in college, you're having the opportunity to really set your own pace. That if you want to take all your classes in two days a week, which I'm sure a few of our freshmen will. I know I did once or twice, and I learned after the first semester that it's not good to take classes from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's really exhausting. Um, but I think it's, it's almost as important as that as far as uh, learning those organizational skills early, right? And, and kind of understanding, maybe you put like an hour or two on your on your on your calendar right after classes, or maybe you study right after classes. That was something that really helped me to kind of get ahead and to really stay ahead. So if for me, I had a really hard time with I don't know why I took it, but anthropology. I don't know why I took anthropology. Don't understand why. Very difficult class, really extremely hard. Someone told me it was a good freshman class, as they always tell us, and I struggled. But what I learned was. I was forgetting the information later on that week and that was putting me behind as far as my study. So after every single class, I would take an hour to review their information, take an hour to review, or well, during that hour while I reviewed information, reviewing my calendar as well, setting those reminders, really getting myself set up for the next stage. So, so really your college day is not so much, it's more so a work day for yourself. How are you really being able to uh, institute those hours throughout the time? Wow. I love that, Jared. I love how you talked, you, you explained like how you had to have a different rhythm and have certain habits in place in order to succeed. That's so important. Does anybody else want to chime in on this question uh, that I may have missed? You can just unmute yourself and come on over if you want to talk and share anything else as it relates to that question. And uh, I don't see anyone. So I'm going to move on to the next question. And I want to address this question. This came up in one of the questions as well um, that, that I got beforehand. And this is for Gerald. This is for Judy. Um, and I'm, I hope I, I believe I have all my, uh, oh, and for Skylar, cause all three of you can answer this question. 
you all graduated with your BA degree and you went on to either get your master's, Gerald, you're in your doctoral program right now. If someone plans on going to get their graduate degree, when do you start preparing and when do you start positioning yourself for that next level after your bachelor's degree? So if all of you can answer that question, that would be awesome. Whoever wants to go first, we'll start with you, Skylar, and then we'll move to Judy. Then we'll come back to you, Gerald. So, uh, Skylar, what, what, would, what would you say? Absolutely. I, so I graduated a year early. So I would say, honestly, as soon as possible. Um, you know, freshman year, you know, it's freshman year. Um, but for me, I had to start my sophomore year, you know, researching universities, where do I want to go, really setting myself up, because that allows you time to, you know, ask your counselors, ask your first gen programs, what is best for me and really figuring out that plan for yourself. So I honestly would say either starting your junior year or starting your sophomore year to really set yourself up for success and you also have to think about if you have to take a test for me i had to take the gre so you want to take it early in case you know sometimes stuff happens sometimes you vomit sometimes you want to retake it so really setting yourself up for success with time is really really important um so doing it as soon as possible awesome awesome what about you judy i echo exactly what scholar said and i would add that Definitely for me personally, I actually started the process late, like in my beginning of my senior year. So I felt like I fell behind in the process of, you know, trying to figure out what program would best fit me. And so you, I feel like you have to put in the same mindset of, in a way you're reapplying to college, right? Where it's like, you're trying to see what program best fits you. You're trying to figure out, okay, like how long is the program exactly? Um, because it's, some programs are shorter, some programs are longer. And so how much time do you want to devote to that? And so I would highly suggest junior year to start think, even like, as she said, sophomore year, start thinking about it, but junior year to start actually making some steps towards it, because you gonna, you should give yourself time to explore the, the, the different programs that are out there. Not just, you know, oh, my school has this, let me just go to that, but explore your options and then also explore how you're gonna pay for it. Because I have learned that financial aid as an undergrad and financial aid as a graduate student is very different. And so if you start junior year, you give yourself that you know, wiggle room to kind of look for those scholarships, look for better loan opportunities, you know, connect with first gen programs that actually give scholarships, which I didn't know. And so you give yourself some time to breathe before you jump into it, okay? So definitely, if you are thinking about master's program already, you know, and you're a freshman, sophomore, then you're off to a good start already. Man, great advice, great advice. Gerald, you went to master's, you were a grad assistant, you're getting your doctoral degree, you are just months away from getting the dissertation journey. Man, and you are under 28 years of age, Gerald. I hope I'm right on that. I mean, you're still young. This brother went to Florida State, went to FIU, and you, I mean, you done, you done just kept it going. So what do you want to say, Gerald? <laughs> they got clapping out for real. First, first of all, I, it's, it's really hard to follow up with Judy and Skylar say they, they were spot on with all of their, all of their uh, tips and tricks for our students coming into their first years. So I guess I'll kind of not only regurgitate, but definitely hit on a couple of high notes that they uh, spoke through. It's, I, I want to say it's increasingly... Um, important for our students to definitely start as early as possible, right? Like as soon as you had that idea of working after college, which is the reason why you go to college, you should be already looking into programs, looking into, so that job search should also coincide with the graduate uh, search for myself. That was one thing that really helped my, uh, my process as well. Um, also make sure that you are considering the types of tests that may be that different, that different universities are requiring. Uh, I'm in higher education, so a lot of our universities are thankfully gearing away from the GRE. Thank you, FIU, for taking care of us, for taking care of that. Um, but, but also be knowledgeable of the options that you have and which ones are requiring certain tests and certain certifications. Um, also want to say uh, connecting with folks, right? That was a big part of my, big part of my journey was connecting with the, for me, it was student affairs. So I was connecting with everyone on my campus. I was in student affairs. I was, they were tired of me by the first month and a half because I had sent so many emails. I'm knocking on doors. I'm setting up lunches. But it's important for you to uh, gain an affinity for the area that you want to go in. So definitely reaching out and connecting with individuals that are in that particular area and having that conversation of how did you get here? What made you want to run this? What made you want to go in this direction? And what is your passion currently now while you're doing this work? Um, and then I also think it's important because uh, I wish I would have told this before I went to grad school, but that, that grad school experience is, 
is it's it's a 180 switch compared to undergrad right mm -hmm. undergrad is really focused on getting involved building these friends building these connect networks but when you get into the graduate program it's really focused on that research element you're going to be in a smaller mm -hmm. cohort of folks that are really going to be doing this you're not going to be as involved with the undergraduate experience so where i'm going with that is i always uh, find it important to reach out to the university that you're interested in applying to and calling that school, right? Like for me, it was Howard. So I was calling the helps department once a week, having a conversation with the director, kind of talking to the expectations. Once again, going back to what, what Judy said a moment ago, looking at funding opportunities there as well. And how are students, um, how, how do you define success in your program, right? So really being able to understand that difference between what, what to expect in graduate school level and also going after it in a multitude of ways. And I'll stop there, Josh. No, that's good. No, y'all keep talking. That's great. I mean, that's that's phenomenal wisdom. I mean, Skylar, Judy, y'all. I mean, y'all gave some great wisdom. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna shift it unless I'm gonna shift this to Zachary because um, another thing that came up, Zachary, was internships. Um, you you're a professional. You've worked at a variety of different jobs. You've done a variety of different things, and um, and others can also chime in as well. But I'm gonna start with you, Zachary, as a professional um, that's worked on the college campus and outside of the college campus. What, when should students start looking for an internship? What, what, when do they start? Uh, what should they look for in the internship experience? Uh, could you share that with us? All right, that's a great question, um, Joshua. And one of the things I want to talk about, like in my book, I Am College Material, I did a lot of research as it, retake, as it relates to that, really talking about like internship success for the emerging professional. I think you want to start getting internships immediately. I say immediately, and um, you want to really build that out over a process of the years that you're in college. And so it's very important to make the hometown connection. So maybe uh, going when you're, you're rising sophomore year, you want to get a internship in your, your hometown because you never know you may want to come back home. So you want to start to build um, relationships in your particular profession. You may also want to reach out to all of the professional groups that are connected to your major. So if you are interested in becoming a veterinarian, you want to be a part of the veterinary group in your local town because I always encourage students that I have the opportunity to converse uh, with not only to have an internship, but to work that internship and to work the town and the region. You want to be getting involved. You want to understand what the civic associations are because the whole point is you want to be top of mind. You want to be top of mind when people say, wow, we have a new opportunity. Oh, wow, we had an awesome young person. Uh, we met them at the Circle of Change uh, conference and we want to follow up with them. So that's very important. It's also very important to consider uh, doing some type of internship, maybe at the person, maybe at the body that regulates um, your particular industry or the body that lobbies for your particular industry. This gives you an opportunity to really, um, if you go to the regulator point, this gives you an opportunity to really find out some of the point. Like if you want to be a psychologist, well, who regulates psychologists? Who regulates their licenses? Who regulates what they're able to do? You want to possibly intern there so that you can build relationships there. And then while you're an intern somewhere else or you're working somewhere else, you can give them insight on these people who they have to renew their, with whom they may have to renew their licenses and things of that nature. But then if you intern with the lobbying group of that particular um, field, now you know the future of that, that industry. You know their challenges. You know what they're trying to um, pursue. You know what barriers might be coming. And so that makes you a valuable asset for future employers. And then I think it's very important to go to uh, get internship experience at one of the top providers of your particular industry. If it's higher education, who are the top leaders in that particular industry? If you can't directly get that internship at Apple or Target, look at, um, look at the research and find out who their top vendors are. Believe me, if you're a person who are going into uh, technology or if you're going to higher ed and you have relationships with Harvard, if you have relationships with uh, companies or organizations that do a lot of business with those entities, you become a valuable um, asset when it comes terms to trying to get a career. You become a, a tremendously valuable asset. And the people, um, I think it's very important while you're working those communities, while you're in those cities, if you go to a city outside your current city, you want to join the alumni association of your college there you want to fellowship with them you want to make those connections so that those people can start to open doors for you within that particular city you want to keep those relationships fresh and uh, relevant so that you can activate them at the appropriate time 
please believe if you have, if you're a hotshot intern at some of these top places, the people that you come in contact with, they're going to be at other places and they may be able to create opportunities for you, or you never know. You may be working at company A, but you interned at company C. And because you have inroads there, you may be able to get some best practices in company A because you have that type of exposure, or you may be able to create opportunities uh, for your company or the other company because of those relationships. So I would say that those are some of the ways you want to look at, um, you want to look at opportunities, but by the time you're specifically in your junior year, you want to have an idea of where you might want to work. And just like we don't get married on the first date, you want an opportunity to date and court your particular opportunity, use your internship opportunity as an opportunity to vet the right fit. Is this, a, this company a good fit? Do they value me? Um, do I see an opportunity to promote? Use it before you get married to that first company. Because where you work first, how you start in your industry is very important. It has a tremendous impact on your earning potential. If you earn less, it's hard to, to add dollars. So it's very important to start strong. And so use those internships as an opportunity to vet court and date um, opportunities. That's very important. Awesome. That was a great point. That was a great point, Zachary. Um, I want to get to this question. Oh, I think Gerald has something to say. Gerald, do you have something to say? I was going to say I love internships. I definitely wanted to just uh, definitely reiterate that as well. And one thing I want to definitely throw in there, too, is to reiterate what Zachary said as far as joining with student organizations. As a freshman, I, I would say doing this for freshman year, I was a highly favored and fortunate to gain an internship my freshman year by joining a sports organization and interning for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Go Jag. Jacksonville, that was really exciting. Um, but I think it, the, the, the biggest thing was also I wanted to talk about is that career center piece in how often you should visit the career center during this process. As a freshman, I went twice a semester. I was twice in the fall, twice in the spring, beginning of fall, in the, in the fall. And then in sophomore, junior, senior year, I went at least once or twice a semester as well, updating my cover letter resume. And some career centers also do virtual interviews for you as well. Um, so the different ways you can kind of get yourself prepared to be in that position to get a great internship. Um, and lastly, uh, make sure you attend the career fairs. As a freshman, don't wait till your sophomore, junior year. It's important to attend them now. You can leverage the opportunity that you have as far as being a future college graduate in front of these employers start having these early conversations they may have an internship for you may not be paid but hey it's a good way for you to get your foot in that door and as a freshman you just want to get your foot in the door and you might sit for the rest of your life so those are those three things i want to throw out there josh i know i'm talking fast but i didn't want to kill no it's time. all good no no this is great no i'm loving it. this is good y'all i wanted to add along i want to add along to what gerald said which i thought was very valuable um, for the for your freshman and sophomore year, I highly recommend that you volunteer for those uh, career fairs. Volunteer, you get a certain level of exposure um, with the um, recruiters when you volunteer, getting them coffee, making sure they're comfortable, letting them know that hey, I'm I'm Zachary Rankins, I'm a second year MBA student, um, I'm looking at, for marketing opportunities. I'm your guy. Anything you need, you need some coffee. You want? I I, I park I've parked for people before. I've had professors say, hey, take so and so over here, and, and you do it. And believe me. Those volunteer opportunities give you the opportunity to really make a, um, a name for yourself and really make an impression that just walking by and handing your, your, um, your business card and your resume um, just doesn't. So use those opportunities to really volunteer and build relationships with the recruiters and find out, um, find out what, um, how you can add value and how it might be a fit. No, that's great. That's great, man. Really great insight. I want to um, I want to shift this conversation because I want to get to some current situations uh, that are affecting college campuses right now. Um, there's three and I want to begin with virtual learning. Uh, we just did an opening session on how to be a virtual college student. But again, you all are living it. Most of you are living it. Uh, I know Zachary's a professional like myself, but but you're living it. Um, many of you started college traditional sense. We're going to campus and boom, COVID-19 hits. And now it's virtual. So I want to I'm going to actually put two together. How are you adjusting to COVID-19 and being a virtual student? What are some lessons that you can share with freshmen that are getting ready to enter into the beginning or the second year of the collegiate experience where this is a reality? And I would love everyone to go. I'm going to start with you, Karina. We're going to go back to California. Karina, I'm going to start with you. But I would love for everyone to share their insight because I think it'd be great to hear everyone's perspective on these two questions, virtual learning and then COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, I think um, when, because the the switch happened in like mid-March, so I've had quite a bit of time to get adjusted to it once again. Um, it's been a little difficult just because it is 
a bit harder to get a hold of some people, but it's not impossible. It is not impossible. Um, and you do want to go ahead and connect with um, your resources, see who is available. Like right now, I've honestly been able to, because I was everywhere before, I actually now have the time to meet with my nutritionist on campus. So, you know, there is plus to being virtual. Um, you have that good flexibility. I think in the way that you can succeed, definitely, is making sure that you have time management. And I do want to reiterate that time management is such a beautiful word. It, they make they make it look so clean. There's essential oils and, you know, beautiful music playing in the background, and you're just so cut and clean, and that is not the case. We say time management, but it's honestly, like, in my experience, at least, like, you're kind of just struggling getting <laughs> getting everything managed because, you know, things happen in life. Your energy is not consistent every single day. And, you know, there may be work loads that are bigger on some days and smaller on others. So it always flexes. It's never consistent or the same. But when I say time management, my biggest thing is to get physical. So get yourself calendars, write things down. We are so used to um, looking at screens all the time right now that I think it's so important now more than ever to write things out. Use your hands to scribble some notes, to get, paper, uh, to get paper, some planners, calendars, whatever you can, and jot all your um, to-dos and your due dates down. Um, for freshmen, when you register for classes, I believe a few days before, you actually have, and definitely by the first day of classes, the syllabi is already up for all of your classes. And so go ahead and look at that. Everything is already scheduled out. So write down the due dates. So you already know ahead of time what is coming up. And then honestly, the biggest thing I want to say that I've learned is to take breaks. Take plenty of breaks and do not feel guilty about taking breaks. I felt so guilty about stepping aside and then laying down on my bed. But honestly, we're staring at screens all the time more than ever now. Imagine how much time you spend on your phone looking at social media or you're watching a movie or a television show. You know, we're looking at screens all the time. So it is completely okay to take plenty of breaks and not feel guilty about them. And the biggest thing, even though it is virtual, participate. Participate, participate, participate. Ask questions, give out your opinion whenever you can. Awesome, awesome. Skylar. Absolutely. I think, you know, virtual learning is difficult. To be completely transparent, it is difficult for everyone. Um, and you honestly just have to be flexible. That's my biggest advice is just be flexible. Um, you know, and honestly, be honest with yourself. Like if you are just too overwhelmed and you need to take a break, take that break for yourself. Um, just, you know, you know yourself the best. And you can honestly ask the professor like, hey, I'm just having a hard time. I will get this to you as soon as possible. And just be completely transparent, especially during these times. Most professors understand and know that this is just the way it is. So just be transparent. As far as time management, for me, I have to write things down. I have to, have to, have to. Um, just because being a grad student and working almost full time is very, very difficult. You have to be balanced and you have to understand yourself. And finding yourself during this time is a little difficult, but if it is just too overwhelming, just know yourself and take those breaks. That's probably my biggest advice. I love it, I love it. What about you, Eloy? So I would recommend, yeah, I would recommend um, to really find the hours of the day that you are most productive. I'm really productive early in the morning and then in the evening. So it seems like an interesting dichotomy, but capitalize on that. If you aren't productive at a certain time of day, don't put yourself in that situation and think, well, now is the time that I'm going to do it. Something else I will recommend is don't double dip your attention. What I mean is turn off the Netflix, put your switch away. Don't think that you can do your classwork and do something else at the same time. Instead, like the girls are saying, or like has been said, give yourself that hour and a half to watch Netflix uninterrupted. Give yourself that hour, hour and a half to play on your switch uninterrupted. Don't feel guilty about it, do it. And then once you're done, dedicate the same amount of time at least to your work, right? And that way, you won't be as inclined to reach over and grab your phone because you know that you already spent sufficient amount of time on it and now you're doing something else. 
So if you can compartmentalize what you're doing, I think it can help. Gerald or uh, Judy? I'll go. Um, so I think I reset it. This quarantine virtual life learning has been very difficult. Um, and so the advice has, ha has already been given. I don't want to like, you know, say it again or regurgitate it as a reduced thing. But um, what I have found is very necessary during this time, especially if you are a freshman or a sophomore entering um, with this new way of learning, I would highly suggest and encourage, and if I can scream it, scream it, um, going to your counseling center, finding what that it looks like on your campus, um, and scheduling an appointment at least once. Um, I don't think we've realized since we've been so thrown into this like new way of life, how much it's affected our learning, how much it's affected our, you know, emotional state, mental state. And so I highly suggest, and like, I've been like in the process of like looking for interviewing different therapists and clinicians, because like, I've realized that my work and my productivity and my, you know, ability to keep going has been affected by this whole COVID-19 mm -hmm. and sitting down and talking to someone who's unbiased, who doesn't really know my life, um, is, is a way for me to kind of keep going. So I highly suggest that because most college campuses do have counseling centers and they usually do offer a certain amount of sessions free for students. And so I highly suggest that you look into that because you, I, God forbid, you know, you get to the end of the semester, you're emotionally, mentally, physically drained. And, you know, just having one conversation could have helped and changed the trajectory of, you know, your success. So please, 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 at least just one, I'm asking just one meeting with um, a counselor on your campus. Awesome. What about you, Gerald? Yes, sir. Uh, I kind of took some, took some things out here. I got four points of how I've kind of adjusted to COVID-19 and this virtual learning space that we're in with our students, how university we transitioned to complete online classes this year, or at least this fall. So I think for me, uh, being a grad student, our classes are also online. They were online this summer. It was big as far as my ability to, this may sound crazy, but really building that call endurance and, and kind of understanding that we're going to be in this quote unquote new normal for uh, an unforeseen amount of time. So being able to um, once I think you always said it earlier, you're finding those moments of the day where you're most where you're most ready to work and really being able to create an atmosphere or space within your within your own living quarters where you feel comfortable with really engaging in a virtual uh, learning environment. Um, the next thing would be it kind of going back to that is really being able to take advantage of this virtual space. Um, I think everyone is having webinars right now, right? Uh, you, you got a lot of virtual career opportunities, virtual virtual career fairs. I know. Um, oh my gosh, I'm. I'm just, I can't think of the organization in Florida, but we have a lot of organizations now that are really um, providing these virtual career opportunities and experiences. Um, so definitely be able to take advantage of that new space and find, find new ways to really uh, engage yourself there. Um, next would be the, uh, will be um, finding a way to have a sense of communication with your faculty member. I'm sure that's going to be a lot harder for uh, our freshmen and sophomores that are in these classes of 300 plus at Florida State. That was my freshman year. Every class was like three, 400 people. I'm like, oh my goodness, how do I know what's going on here? But I, but I really think it could be uh, vital for you to rather just send that communication to your professor early, introducing who you are and kind of being able to build out that connection space is important because it's important to not only have it there, but also maybe to look into creating a chat group. So we, we've done that with, with a lot of my summer classes. Now they have it on Blackboard. Now you can create a chat group there through some Blackboards and, uh, so, and you can also do it on your phone too. So being able to connect with the folks that are in your class can be just as important to help you definitely to stay engaged. But uh, I, I do wanna say everyone to, to, to continue to feel confident in, the, in this new space. I know it's a little bit different and a lot of us are used to that in-person uh, in, in, in environment and that kind of communication, but um, there will be opportunities for it for all of us to take advantage of this new of this new normal awesome awesome um real quick zach did you want to say anything because i got i got two questions i'm pressing but what do you got anything you want to say zach all right i, I just um i want to um, add on to what everyone else said but the first thing um it's always okay to ask for help but the one thing i just want to say to all um high school graduates um don't assume that you're college ready don't assume that you're college ready. Um, I would say that go to your counseling center and take advantage of all of the testing opportunities. Um, you have personality tests, you have read, reading comprehension um, 
tests and things of that nature, you have certain assessments to help you understand yourself a little bit better, how you consume information, how you comprehend information, and also um, create a system. Um, there are systems for success, and so create that routine so you can build your, 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 yourself a system that will help you build a bridge to success. So that's very important. And any routine you have, it may be um, 9 through 6. From 9 through 6, I do school. After 6, um, I do me. And so that's something that's very important. And college is not the 13th grade. It's very important to um, take that assessment and then use some of that information to give yourself a competitive advantage. The most desirable skill in the world is adaptability, and you can't adapt to anything if you don't assess it. So take that time to assess and process what's going on, and then you can adapt to great success. So that's very important. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I got one question. So, Gerald, I know you're an alpha, and so I got to ask this question. If someone's going to want to be a part of Greek life, um, you know, Phi Beta Sigma is the best for turning the world. But, uh, Gerald, you're the panelist today. If there's anyone else on the panel who wants to share, I just know for a fact you're, 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 uh, you're part of the Divine Nine. Anything you want to share about that, Gerald, for those that may be interested in joining the fraternity or sorority once they start? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm good. Thank you, Josh, for putting that, putting that spotlight on me there. Uh, I love my, I love my <laughs> Sigma guys as well, man. I have a lot of Sigma mentors and mentees, so respect with the, all, all organizations within the Divine Nine. Uh, I think we're in a very unique space, and I think as freshmen, I'm, I, I'm not sure who mentioned it earlier, but someone did mention that pressure to join a Greek letter organization when you came on campus because it does look cool. And especially now, it's going to look a little bit different now that we're in a virtual space as well. And some of those expectations for the membership um, intake processes will also be changing. But um, for an incoming freshman that may be interested in joining those organizations, I really um, think it's incumbent upon you really to uh, not just only just do your research as everyone says, but really um, develop the develop yourself. I think that's the biggest thing a lot of people kind of miss during this entire intake process is that these these organizations are looking for for members of the community that are that are really striving to be the best that they can be not really those that are chasing as they say not we're not really chasing those jacket wears or those coat wears. we're chasing those individuals that are out there in the community that are really being true to self being authentic um, and really creating those genuine uh, connections and bonds with the members of the organization um, how that will look in this fall and spring i'm not really sure since we're going to be off campus in most in most institutions uh, but our greek organizations will be doing programming i'm sure in a virtual sense be sure to definitely attend that information, but definitely, uh, I think if you think your first and second year is important for folks to definitely focus on oneself and that kind of stuff kind of comes organically. Awesome. Awesome. I want to move to this question because, uh, man, can you believe it? We've talked for 51 minutes, uh, but I want to move to this question really quickly because I think this is uh, it's real. And I think and each of you is culturally diverse. Um, each of you um, understand the issues as far as racial tension, as far as politics and all the other things that are happening. There was a study, as a matter of fact, uh, at UCLA, um, it was ticking in 2015, and they said there was a, a big percentage of students that would at some point be uh, student activists. Um, and so I know a lot of students are speaking up. I know a lot of people are protesting. I know a lot of people are uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter. And so what I wanna ask all of you, because um, all of you are actually culturally diverse, um, how do you adapt as a college student to all the things that are going on, not only on our campuses, but also in our nation, in our world. What, how do you adapt as a culturally diverse student? So you're all, you all can, can speak on it, uh, but I, I definitely want to point that out because I think that's so important. Judy, you are in the Office of Multicultural Center and I see you raising your hand, so I'll, we'll start with you. That's what I wanted to start. Um, so I think though, in terms of like adapting to being being an activist or like understanding what activism is why you're trying to go through your college experience um it's like a, it's a lot and it's hard because you're also experiencing it emotionally and trying to react to it but i would say um i would advise if your campus does have you know a center for inclusive excellence or you know an office that kind of handles these situations and you are you know in this point where it's like i do want to see what i can do in terms of service or in terms of, you know, active activism, you know, reach out to that office or that center. Um, what I also found was very helpful um, with the center that I worked with was connecting with different organizations on campus. Um, so not only organizations on campus, but like off campus. So like looking at what are some of the organizations in your school city, not like where you're from or something, but your school city that are doing some of this work 
that are, you know, speaking out on some of the things. Like, you can get involved in those ways. You can see what you can do if you're the person where it's like, I want to do something. Um, I don't know where to start, but like, I'm a student who does want to do something. Um, and then also, there's a lot of conferences and like organizations that offer student resources on how you can, you know, continue the work, how you can start the work, how you can, um, you know, be an activist on your campus. And don't be afraid to start certain things on your campus. Um, I think what I've learned in my working in the office and then also my career is that um, you can't get, you can't really get in trouble for protesting on campus. Um, I'm not saying that do it and everything, but like you can't really get in trouble for it. Um, it's like a policy in most schools. But like overall, if you are a student who, you know, you're trying to respond to this, um, what's happening around you, you're trying to respond what's happening you know, socially, um, you know, talk to some of these organizations, talk to the office that handles these issues. But also one thing that was important for me, it was how my school is responding to some of the incidents and issues that are going around. Mm -hmm. And if your school is not responding the way you would hope, you got to find a way to do something. If, if you're willing to, you know, you got to find a way to like express that. So because for, for, I feel as though if you're in a space where you are a student who wants to, especially specifically a student of color in a space where it's predominantly white and your school's not necessarily responding to the issues in the way that says they um, value you as a student of color, um, you gotta, I highly suggest that you find an organization or find a mentor or find somebody that you can process that with and kind of how do I continue to adapt or how do I continue to grow in a space like this? So yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> awesome. I know Eloy got something to say. I know Eloy. I know he's way. So Eloy, I'm gonna let you I, I just know Eloy was gonna have something to say. So I know that this is part of his his thing. So yeah. Yeah, my future goal is to become a chief diversity officer, hopefully for an institution or for a corporation to move the needle forward. And Thank you, Josh, for bringing us all together and also curating this diverse space. Um, that being said, to add to what Judy is saying, you have so much influence as a student. This institution is created to cater to you, <laughs> to us. So they need to be serving you as much as you serve them. And trust me, by paying tuition, we are serving them. That being said, um, I felt like I needed to, I, I, I created a podcast. I went to the radio station on campus. I told them I had an idea for a podcast after honestly um, going to the Circle of Change Leadership Conference. It started there. It's called LPD Cast. It's for leadership and professional development podcast for first generation students of color. What we do there is we have ourselves come and speak about our experiences. And with this transition, uh, I've amplified the voices of as many people as I can. And that's what I'm continuing to do. As a non-Black person and as an ally, what we can do is pass the mic. <laughs> Create a platform and then pass the mic. And if you don't know where to begin, I'll tell you a few places. Mark Lamont Hill is amazing. Brittany Pacchietti is amazing. Tamika Mallory is amazing. There are so many people out here that are teaching us what we need to know and also teaching us how to move forward, how to amplify, how to contribute. So I know that right now we can't be on campus. However, I'll finish with this. Being a university student, you have access to so many resources. By, by being a university student, I was able to download and have access to the Adobe um, software suite for free. So I downloaded Audition, which is where I record and I edit my podcast. I've downloaded Photoshop, which is where I create the the graphic designing things aspects for it. And where do I learn on YouTube? I'm studying communication, not digital stuff, right? So as long as you have, like Judy is saying, the passion for it, and you can find somewhere to funnel it, and you can find someone to guide you, again, this is a lot of accountability and a lot of work. But if you're about it, you're going to do it, we're going to do it. And then you move forward, you move forward, and you're passionate about it. And you continue to have these conversations, even if you're red in the face, and even when your voice is shaking because we need to continue to move the needle forward. That's awesome, awesome, awesome point. I wanna clarify, you know, I, I just hit me, the resources that are available as a college student, I mean, the Adobe, the Photoshop, man, that, that, that's amazing. And, and if you can learn that stuff, 
Um, I remember Mike. Mike is our video producer right now. And uh, I met him when he was actually in school. And now he's been working with me for like, I guess, seven years now, Mike. And man, he knows it all. And I remember he always tells me, if you're a student, you got to hook up, you know, even on a even on a MacBook, even on a MacBook, a new computer, you know, all this stuff. There's there's opportunities to students. I'm glad you brought that up. I totally didn't. We didn't have that when I was in college. So I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, but anybody else want to talk about that? I don't want to uh, I didn't want to stop any more people. I think Karina has something to say. And Zach. Um, just really quick for myself. Um, I want to point out that not everyone. I mean, so for myself, I have I have anxiety disorder, so I'm prone to panic attacks and um, so protests they're not necessarily something that I can emotionally take in all the time but I've been able because it's it's that weird fine balance right where you want to be involved but how do you not um, put yourself at, at risk emotionally and mentally as well right and so what I've done is that I for myself at least I've been able to be the photographer or the marketing person. I'm also highly, well, I was highly involved on campus. So every, I put myself in, um, in meetings and in places where I heard the stories of students. And I brought that straight to faculty. I put that exactly to the faculty's face. And I said, this is what I've heard on this campus. So what is your response? Or what is this college? Or what is this department going to do about it? And so those are all different ways and not, when we talk about activism i just don't want you to think of it as just being there up front of course we need people there up front right but not every single professor is going to be seeing those protests on campus and so you bring it up to them face to face and so those are other ways that's great that's great that's a really good perspective and um that was awesome career that, that, and that anxiety is real Especially right now, it can be very real. I, I can relate on certain levels for sure. Uh, uh, Zachary, I know you have something to say. All right. Um, I, I must preface my statement by saying, uh, first and foremost, that um, it was almost 20 years uh, when I first stepped on a college campus. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm biased by mortgages and responsibilities and things of that nature. Um, but I would say this as a, as a college student that I think that's very important. The most important thing that you can do as an activist is get a high quality education. I've had the opportunity to work at um, institutions of higher education, at advocacy organizations, and I've come to the conclusion that um, even though there are a lot of sincere people, many of them don't have the educational underpinnings or the actual skill sets to advance on um, what they're really sincere about. So I think it's a great thing that um, Judy and Skylar are pursuing um, advanced degrees to get licenses to be able to advance what they really are passionate about. I think it's a great thing that um, soon to be Dr. Johnson um, is able to acquire those skills so he can really uh, diagnose from a policy standpoint and really have an impact. So if you really want to have an impact on something you believe in, it's very important uh, to, to sharpen your, 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 the acts of your education so that you can have an impact and chop down those inequalities. Because anything I believe in, I can have a very educated conversation about it because I've consumed the information. Two, um, students are very powerful. But not, um, but don't be, don't don't communicate in a sense that burns bridges. Um, for example, at your at your university, if a, if a professor is untenured, if a professor doesn't have tenure, and you find them um, acting in ways that are unbecoming of the university or acting in ways that compromise inclusion or anything like that. Um, because they're not tenured, they're they're consistently in the job applicant process. As a student, you can sit on their, um, at state institutions in most cases, you can sit on their hiring committee, you can write a note to their hiring committee, trust me, that's more effective than um, holding up a sign saying this person's not fair. If there's a sign, if they have to answer that question to a hiring committee, that's, that's more powerful. So there are many, there are many resources available. And then I would say, take the approach like, um, I will conclude and say, take the approach like Elo and Karina just mentioned. When I was in school, I created a radio show similar to the podcast called It's Payday. I got tired of financial, like uh, financial illiteracy in, in my community, quite frankly. And when you're a college student, you have superpowers. I promise you. If you're a college student, um, anybody will give you two or three minutes of their time. Anybody. 
I, I promise you, if it's Bill Gates, if it's the president of the United States, they will give you a few minutes of their time. When I have my radio show, I interview Congress people, uh, governors, uh, political candidates, um, celebrities, all kinds of things. They were willing to share a few minutes of their time um, to give insights to young people and have an impact. So I would just say the best thing you can do to advocate for anything you believe in is getting the best um, education you possibly can building relationships to really have a systemic impact on what it is that you're trying to do. Um, I think that that's very important. Man, phenomenal points. Wow, really, really great points. Um, Skylar, yes, stay away, Skylar, I see you. Thank you. I just wanted to add, uh, we have all had amazing, amazing points. But I just want to say, do what you can and really use your voice. Like everyone said, we are very powerful um, and people hear us, like they do. Like even if you don't think they do, they do. Um, and that also goes along. I think there was a lot of pressure with specifically my generation on social media, but there are other things that you can do besides social media to make an impact, especially within your community. So I don't want social pressures to limit you to what you want to do, because there's not one right way. You can make a difference in more than one way. And I just really, really wanted to emphasize that point. I love it, man. Great points. Y'all did a phenomenal job. Um, really quickly, is there any questions from those that are logged on to this uh, this session meeting on Zoom? Are there any questions that you would like to bring up randomly before um, I give them the last question before we get ready to conclude this session? Are there any questions? I don't see none right now, uh, which is all right. It's perfectly fine. They did a phenomenal job. You are, you all been locked in. Um, I think this is the last question tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about resiliency in the final session. So I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to start with you, Zach, and we'll move back to Karina. But I want to ask you um, really about 30 seconds. Um, what is one strategy that you have used to overcome one of your greatest challenges in life? 30 seconds. Zach, it's on you. Um, I would say the, the greatest advice when it comes to uh, resiliency is just realizing that when life goes on, uh, people have done it before you, right? They're first generation people who have become doctors, who become lawyers, dentists, et cetera. So understanding and taking comfort in the fact that people have done it before me gives me a lot of confidence and comfort. Um, I think that the procrastination piece like Eloy talked about is very important. If you have to procrastinate, procrastinate on procrastinating, right? <laughs> if, you have to, if you have to procrastinate, so that's something very important. By the inch, by what is a uh, by the yard is hard by the inch a cinch. So just break down pieces. If you if you're trying to carry the whole load by yourself, you'll become overwhelmed. But if you break it down into pieces and, and go step by step, um, it, it's a little um, it's a little less intimidating. And you can you know just believe in yourself and have the confidence um, just to to keep going step by step. Skyler, back to Arizona. Yes, um, I would definitely say that challenges are going to happen and you just got to keep going. You just got to pick yourself back up and keep in mind your goal. Um, keep in mind why you're doing this, why this is your passion and what do you want to get out of it? Um, because challenges are always going to arrive. I think definitely my biggest challenge um, was my freshman year. I actually failed two classes and I was like, it's college for me and I want my PhD and I picked myself back up. I got a double major. Here I am, I graduated a year early and I didn't let it set me back. So don't let anything that comes in your way discourage you because at the end of the day, you are your own fighter. And if you pick yourself back up and keep going, you're gonna achieve your goals and achieve every single thing you wanna achieve. I love it. We're going to Howard, Gerald. So thank you there, Josh. I think for me, I'm sure that folks are probably seeing that Instagram post that is going around where you see uh, at age 21, this person may get their, their PhD at age 26, this person may be just graduating from college. I think that goes back to the fact that we all have our own individual story. We're all going to have our own individual challenges, hurdles and successes and achievements. So um, even when things look bleak, as they sometimes do, um, it's very important for those to keep your head, you know what I'm saying, to keep your head unbowed. Um, and, and, and then to continue to push forward and to remain calm and, and, and composed as you want the first one to experience these hardships. Um, I'm moving to a new place recently and I've been experiencing every hardship possible for every single route, but you know, I have to keep my hand at the case to remain calm <laughs> and know that everything is going to work out well because, you know, that's the same thing college was. Things are not going to always work out the way you want them to be planned, but to stay resilient. 
emotional intelligence. Um, we're going, uh, oh man, we're going up to Boston. Judy. <laughs> um, so I would definitely say um, in my own experience, but also I, I have a younger brother who's actually a freshman who's going to be a freshman at Berkeley College of Music. And so like this semester, this summer has been like a lot for us. Um, so I'm re-experiencing um, freshman year all over again. And um, what I realized was that what I asked them in terms of it's connected to resiliency was I asked them, does he feel like it's worth it? Um, and so for him, once he was able to find out like, no, like getting into the school and going into the school and like getting where I need to be, you know, is worth it. So I think once you're able to decide for yourself, if, it's go if you feel as though it's going to be worth it or you feel like, okay, I made this decision to go to college um, because of my career. Once you decide that, like something's gonna switch in your brain and honestly, like you're gonna feel like, okay, there's nothing that's gonna stop me because I have that end goal. I already know my end goal is worth it. So there's nothing that's gonna stop me. It's connected to the fact that you'll be able to fight the fight because you know, okay, like my end is there. Even though my path, might look a little um fuzzy and like there's a storm in my path there's probably a flood in front of me you're gonna swim through it and you'll make it because you already had the mind set the growth mindset that okay that's my goal and no matter what's in between i'm gonna reach that goal i love it awesome awesome we're going back out to california eloy san bernardino Y'all have been so wonderful. I don't know how much more I can add, but um, yes, reminding yourselves that perseverance pays off. And to what Gerald was saying, emotional intelligence, right? Mastery of your emotions of being, checking in with yourself. What am I going through? Is, will, will acting out or having an emotional outburst, you know, is it gonna be worth the long run? Or can I, can I cool off in a different way that will allow me to um, really connect with what I'm going through and what I'm feeling? And also what Judy said about a growth mindset of you're really committed to yourself that you are going to be a better human. You know, there's no going back from that. So give yourself this moment, give yourself the moment that you need. And resiliency is going to look different. Some days, like Dr. Anita has said, a good friend of mine, Dr. Anita says, some days it's going to be going from the bed to the couch or from going downstairs to upstairs, right? Some days it'll look like that, but keep, be kind to yourself and remember that Tomorrow, you have another chance, and tomorrow is a new day. Do what you have to today to make tomorrow that much better. Awesome. Uh, Karina, we're out. We're still staying in California. La La Land. What do you got, Karina? Um, everyone has said amazing stuff, but the one thing I want to bring on the table is to know when it is self-care and then when it is community care. And I think we got to focus a lot on community care. Um, I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know what your household is, how much support you've had, what kind of change you want to have in life. But when we talk about connecting and making those um, interactions on campus, it's really building up your community care because things are going to happen, hardships, adversity is going to happen. So who is going to be behind you to help you pick you back up? I know that we have this great idea that we're all strong, but sometimes we need that help sometimes we need people to point things out in our lives like hey i've noticed your energy has been low are you okay you know there can be people around you that will point things out that you didn't even realize yourself and so community care is so important so you've got to figure out who your community is and put in a lot of quality into that fantastic you all were so amazing uh we want to thank you all so much for taking the time on this saturday afternoon to share your knowledge. For those of you that are still with me, Michael is gonna put a link in there right now because we're gonna, you're, we're getting ready to transition into our Future Leaders networking session. Um, we couldn't do it here because this is literally a webinar format on Zoom. And with the webinar format on Zoom, we can't have like the boxes where you see everyone. And so we have to literally transfer to another room. Um, it's gonna start literally five minutes after this. So literally five minutes after this session, um, give yourself a five minute break just to get ready. Um, you'll go into that room. Um, one of our wonderful professionals, Angelica Castro, will be leading that session. She'll be over there. Um, and it's just going to be a dialogue. She's going to lead you just through networking and talking with each other. Um, and again, you know, one of the big things about conferences or virtual conferences is you don't just want to learn, but you want to connect. You want to network with other people. 
Um, and so I encourage those of you who are here, I think there's like 12 attendees right now to go over there. Uh, after this is concluded, we'll be done like one to two more minutes. Uh, but you want to go over there and you want to join the meeting group with Angelica and just talk and really get to know each other. Because throughout the year, like uh, Karina just said, it's a community support. You're going to need each other. And the wonderful thing about this program is not only do you get to build community on your campus, but you get to build community at other institutions as well. So the, the link is there. So it's for you to, to hit on the link. Again, we want to thank uh, all of our wonderful panelists. We want to thank everyone so much for this opportunity. And um, again, when you go with Angelica, she'll be there to meet you. And then after that session, we'll see y'all tonight, I believe 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we start off with the DJ. I got a last minute word on resiliency. Uh, so it's gonna be turned up. And then we have a turn up party right afterwards, a virtual turn up party. So we turn it up tonight. So I look forward to seeing y'all. And Karina, you're already dancing, so we should start dancing right now. The DJ is not with us though, but, but it's going down tonight. Uh, so again, I wanna thank y'all so much and we'll see you later this evening. And Angelica is waiting for you in the meeting room. Thanks everyone, peace.